Morning, everyone. Great to be back um, from sabbatical. Um, looking forward to sharing uh, over the coming weeks and months the uh, many different things the Lord's been uh, saying to, to me. And, um, but it's been a blessing. We've had some uh, really great family time. And um, one of the things I got to do was, I, was to spend a, a number of weeks away in some different monasteries, um, just seeking the Lord. And I was reminded very simply that there is nothing like the presence of Jesus. You know, in the Lord's presence, um, worry, anxiety disappears. Joy comes. Peace comes. And, you know, for me, it was, a, it was a time to reconnect with the Lord in a, a deeper way, kind of getting back to the heart of faith. And in many ways, that is the longing of Paul for the churches in Galatia. Because they're in, in danger of becoming disconnected from God, of losing their joy and their peace and the freedom that should be theirs. And notice, he, he doesn't come kind of gently and say, don't worry, that's just what happens as you kind of go on with the Lord. That's just as, you know, as you become a mature Christian, you know, joy just kind of goes. You know, things just become hard. No, he says, look, you, you foolish Galatians. I mean, imagine someone coming this morning and saying, you foolish Holland Roaders. It's like, what are you doing? Who's bewitched you? I mean, he's, he's so troubled by what has happened to them. You know, their following of Jesus that had begun with great joy, with verse 1, it says, seeing Christ crucified, understanding something of the profound mystery that Christ died for them. The, the, the Lord who made everything has come to live in them by his Spirit. They've been seeing miracles at work in their midst. And he's saying, look, that was supposed to carry on. And yet it hasn't. Something's changed. They've become weighed down with other things. They, the things they've been told they kind of had to do to be proper Christians. Specifically to be circumcised and to kind of follow the Old Testament law. And the, the joy had kind of left the room. And so perhaps had the power of the Holy Spirit. How does that happen? Why does that happen? For churches, for individuals. You know, when you become a Christian, you, you begin, don't you, with that amazing sense of freedom and, and faith and wonder. But sadly, we can then find ourselves in a very different place. A place that feels dead, like slavery. You know, earlier in the summer, I was talking with a mature Christian friend who, who said when he first became a Christian, he saw God do so much. He saw the Spirit move, a wonderful sense of God's presence, and yet now, decades later, it seems so dry. Do you know what it is to feel like that? Why does that happen? Why does joy slip away? Why do we not see the, the changes in our lives sometimes that we've longed to see? How, you know, how is it that Christians can be such a mess sometimes? Do you ever wonder that? You know, why aren't Christians more Christian? Maybe you're wondering that about your own life. You know, where's the joy and the delight gone? How are Christians supposed to stay close to God and be transformed to become more like Jesus. That's what the Galatians have been wrestling with, and clearly they've come up with some wrong answers. And as churches and individuals, we um, tend to consistently come up with two major wrong answers, both of which lead us away from the gospel, away from Jesus, away from freedom, and back into slavery. I bet you have tried both of these in your life. I know I have. I can do both of these things on the same day. The first solution, and this has been very common in the past, and it's to pursue legalism. 
Legalism is where we try kind of adding to the gospel and the work of Jesus. We, we tighten the rules. We become stricter with ourselves. We work harder. We put in more effort to live a better life. And we hope that the change we long for would come. And yet, sadly, it so often ends in bitterness and resentment. But we don't just try legalism. See, the other thing we, we, we try to resolve this is through liberalism. And, and you see many churches trying this at the moment. We say, actually, the demands of the gospel and of God's word, they're just, they're just too much. So instead of kind of adding to it, we actually try and take away. We, we lower the standards. We say, well, that bit of the Bible, that's too difficult. Or the Old Testament, oh, that's just, that's too hard. Um, that doesn't fit anymore. We redefine sin. We, we make the path kind of easier and wider until there is no path at all. And Paul is so aware of these two kind of major errors that can happen in the church, that in chapter 3, he sweeps through 2,000 years of biblical history in order to help us see that there is another way, a way that has been there from the beginning and is is the only way to true freedom. So you ready for 2,000 years? First thing he wants them to see, I'm going to try and sum this up in two things. The first thing he wants them to see is salvation is based on God's promises to us, not our promises to him. God's promise to us, not our promises to him. You know, Paul begins with a whole load of rhetorical questions reminding them of how faith started. Look, verse 2, was it by observing the law or by Believing Now, if you remember, the law is the, um, the Ten Commandments, the Torah, the, the first five books of the Bible. And, and the Galatians, they're primarily non-Jews, and so they haven't kept any of the law. None of it. And, and he asks them, how did you become Christians? How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Was it because you were being so good that God looked down on you and thought, finally, I found a group of people who I can work with who were good enough, and so I decided to bless them? It's like, no, of course not. It's because they heard a message of grace. A message of forgiveness, of Christ crucified for them. And they dared to believe it and receive what they could never earn. And crucially, Paul then shows them that this is not a new way for God to work. This has always been the way God has worked. Lots of people misunderstand this. They think, oh, in the Old Testament, God worked a different way, or God was almost different entirely. And in the New Testament, there's something new. He tries a new way. So Paul goes back to the beginning of history, back to Genesis, the beginning of God's people, to the father of all God's people, to Abraham. What's Abraham's story Was Abraham a a really righteous man, a kind of charismatic leader who uh, attracted God's attention and said, well, finally, here's a new people I can work with? No. He was an old man with no future as far as he was aware. No children, elderly wife, no direction, and living in a godless city, and God makes an astounding, kind of ridiculous promise to him. Genesis 12, you might well have heard this promise. He says, I'll make you into a great nation and I'll bless you. He says this, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And verse 6 of Galatians 3 says, Abraham believed, and what happens? What does it, have a look. What does it say? And it was credited to him as righteousness. Righteousness that we were looking at last week is given to Abraham as a gift. It is not earned. He, he, he trusts God's promise, 
And he gets treated as righteous, even though he isn't righteous. It's amazing. That's the wonder of Christianity, that we get treated as righteous, even though we're not. And this is the heart of the gospel that we read in verse 8, was announced to Abraham in advance. So the gospel is not a New Testament idea. It has always been God's salvation plan. The Old Testament and the New Testament, they tell one story about God and about how God can be known. And it's a story not based on our performance and our promises to God, but on God's promise to us. And so that when... God confirms his promise to Abraham shortly after Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. Abraham simply watches, if you know the story, as God passes through the sacrificed animals declaring, I will do this. Abraham says nothing. He has no part of this. He just watches and believes. See, he's not an example of a great godly man who never got anything wrong. If you know his story, you'll know he made many mistakes, yet he repeatedly chooses to trust God more than himself. That is where salvation begins, where we trust God more than ourselves. And that is how salvation and walking with God is supposed to continue where we trust God more than ourselves. Steve Brady writes in his commentary, faith is an absolute transfer of trust from myself to Christ and all he has done. You know, we don't grow as Christians by applying moral teaching to our lives, saying, oh, now I've got to do this. No, we we grow by applying the gospel to every area of our our lives. We, We ask God to show us, where are we trusting in the wrong things? Where am I looking to the wrong things for security or or for acceptance or, or for happiness? What is the root of my behavior? And we come to Jesus and we repent and we ask the Lord to forgive us and change us from the inside out. Have our hearts changed? You know, the alternative is we live by the law, legalism. And the problem with that, actually, is that it kind of works for a short time, or at least it appears to. But it creates huge problems. It creates proud, harsh people who look down on others and think they're better than them. And it creates insecure people who are never sure they have done enough. Verse 10, look with me. Paul declares, all those who rely on the law are under a curse. That means if you're relying on what you do to be saved or to be acceptable to God as you go through life, you are in trouble because verse 11 says, no one is justified by observing the law. No one fully keeps the law. You can't save yourself. Verse 12, the the law is not based on faith. It's based on performance. Do do you ever find yourself making promises with God? I ever kind of doing little deals with God? Do you ever do this? God, if I do this, would you do this? Or, Or maybe you do this. God, I've done all this for you. How could you let that happen? I don't deserve this. When we pray like that, what that is showing is a legalism in our hearts that says, God, give me what I deserve. And it is such a dangerous prayer to pray because what we deserve, what sin deserves is death and hell. And I don't want what I deserve. I want mercy. Lord, show me mercy. You know, the gospel is so much better. It is deeply humbling. It means I never look down on anyone because it declares no one is good. No one is good. We all need a savior, but it is wonderfully reassuring because it declares that in all my mess, of which there's so much, God still loves me, and he still wants me, and he, there's 
nothing I can do to make him not want me. Isn't that amazing? The gospel is such good news, but it kind of all begs the question. If it's all about faith, it's always been about faith in God's promise, why on earth does God give the law? You know, the law of Moses is also from God. Was that kind of just a bad move along the way? You know, if it's such a stumbling block for people, why the law? Secondly and finally, holiness is based on Christ's work, not ours. Salvation is based on God's promise to us, not our promise to him. Holiness is based on Christ's work, not ours. Quick biblical history question. Does anyone know where God's people first received the Ten Commandments? Where, where, did, where did that happen? Mount Sinai, okay? Mount Sinai. Now, here's the important question. When did that happen? Did that happen before or after they were rescued from Egypt? After, okay? So the law comes not to an enslaved people with a message of how to get free, yeah? It comes to a freed people with a message of how to stay free. How does it do that? What's its purpose? Well, Paul uses the example of a human covenant in verse 15 to show, firstly, the law doesn't undermine the promise. That is definitely not what is happening. Verse 17, the law, it says, does not set aside the promise. God never breaks his promises. Instead, the law is intended to lead us to the one who will fulfill the promise. In fact, it's... um, explicitly says this in verse 24. Um, If you just look ahead, the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. This is the seed that Paul talks about in verse 16. So how does it do that? How does the law do that? This is where we're just going to zone in on a couple of verses, verses 19 and 20. Just look at this with me. Why then was the law given at all? That's his question. It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred to had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Clear? Yeah? Got that? Great. Let's move on. They're tricky verses, aren't they? (laughs) Tricky verses to explain. I'm going to try my best. Okay. Firstly, Paul says the law is given because of transgression. That's another word for sin. So at the very least... The law is there to show people their sin. It's like if you're driving too fast on a road and there's no speed limit, it's dangerous, okay? Yeah, if you're just going too fast but there's no limits, it's dangerous, full stop. If you add a speed limit in, okay, and you're still driving too fast, yeah, it's not only dangerous but you know it and you're now a lawbreaker, okay? So that's what the law does. It comes and kind of brings this, this underlining of sin. And so at a basic level, you could say the law of Moses is there to show God's people what the holy life looks like, what an awesome thing it is to come into the presence of a holy God, and therefore ultimately to lead them to an awareness of their shortcomings, their sin, and their need of a saviour. That is true. You might have heard something like that in the past, but there is more here, much more. It says, the law was put into effect by a mediator. Who is that? It's Moses. Moses. So verse 20 says this curious thing. A mediator represents two parties, but God is one. What is the point Paul is making. I think he wants to to see that what God is doing in the law is far bigger and better than they could ever dream. You see, the law was different from the promise, and the law had two parties, okay? So God promises something, and then he invites his people to also make a promise. He says, doesn't he, choose life to them. The problem is, and we've just looked at this, our promises are useless, We're not very good at keeping our promises. The verse 22 is really clear. It says, the Bible Bible says we're prisoners of sin. We're slaves to sin. So what does God do? 
Well, this is where it gets amazing. You see, the law isn't there as a kind of random list of things just to show us how bad we are. It, it's there to show us what we were always meant to be. Um, it's there to show us how we can be in relationship with God. It, it's, it's beautiful. And, and as Jesus comes and steps into history, he doesn't say we're done with that now. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, which deliberately echoes the Mount Sinai giving of the law, he says this, um, Do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, till heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So what is happening with the law? Is it still valid or not? Well, the liberal view is that Jesus comes as like a reforming kind of rabbi and teacher to break open those legalistic practices of the past and to create an easier way of doing things. Nothing could be further from the truth. When Jesus comes... He comes bringing a new law, a new Torah. And this new law, the standards of it are not lower than the law of Moses. They are far higher. So the, the, the social ethic, the moral ethic, the sexual ethic, the, the devotional ethic that Jesus outlines in the Sermon on the Mount is so far above what Moses outlines. It is breathtaking. <laughs> you know, Moses, the law of Moses, was just a glimpse of holiness with one people in one culture at one particular time. Jesus comes and shows, no, that is, there is so much more than that. So here's the conundrum. If what God actually requires of people is far in excess of even the law of Moses, how can he welcome us? How? Well, this is how. Though God is one, yet God became flesh. You see, as Jesus steps into humanity, he steps in not simply representing God because he is God. He steps in representing us, fully man, fully God. Remember that agreement, two parties. Jesus comes to fulfill the parts of both parties. God's part and amazingly, our part. You know, for the first and only time in all of history, we see someone living the law of God. And it is beautiful beyond imagining. I mean, he, he keeps every rule, but is never harsh. He's full of grace and love and compassion. It's just amazing. And then the unthinkable happens. The only person who was therefore not under the curse, we read in verse 13, became a curse for us. The only one free from God's judgment comes under judgment. The only one who, who knows what it is to be kind of face to face with God is cut off from God as he cries on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Why? Well, yes, amazingly to forgive us, to rescue us from our sin, yes, to satisfy justice and take our judgment but more than that, verse 21 says this so he could impart life, give life, to declare us perfect in his sight and, and come and live in us by his spirit. Verse 22, this is how what was promised might be given to those who believe. Because Jesus comes and fulfills everything that is required on our behalf. You know, the cross is how you get a truly transformed people. It's how you get a people 
who finally kind of give up on themselves and start to trust and count on God who gave everything for us. You know, to follow Jesus is to live in utter dependence on what he has done. You know, the irony with legalism and liberalism is they both do the same thing. They put us at the center. Legalism says you can do it. Liberalism says you can't do it. The gospel says Jesus has done it. Amen? He has done what we could never do. And so we come to him and say, God, I come on, I just need mercy. I need your mercy. You know, our journey with Jesus through life is not supposed to be increasing separation and self-reliance. It is supposed to be increasing dependence, empowered by the Spirit, placed, as we're going to see next week, in a position that is unimaginably glorious. You know, the invitation today is simply this. It's to give up on yourself and put your trust in his promise. Jesus' completed work. Receive his Spirit, experience his freedom. Should we pray together? There's a very simple prayer that I prayed many times when I was away. You might want to pray this in your own heart, even right now. It's simply this, Lord have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I'd just like to pray for us for two sets of people right now. If, you, if you're here and you've just been, just been trying harder on your own, you've kind of lost that joy. You need that fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to encourage you, just with every head bowed, just to raise your hand. I'd love to just pray for that fresh joy, fresh assurance that it's all about Jesus. Just raise your hand. I'm just going to pray for you. Look, I'll pray for the many just raising their hands right now. Lord, I thank you that you love us. Lord, thank you that you love to bring your fresh release your fresh peace, fresh joy into our lives. And I pray that you would do that. Pray you bring the reassurance that it's all about you. Come and fill them afresh, I pray. Come, Holy Spirit. If this morning you just need a um, a fresh revelation of who Jesus is and what he's done, you need faith this morning. Faith to believe. Just raise your hand and I'd just love to pray for you as well. Lord, you can see those hands that are raised right now. Those asking for faith. Fresh seeing of all you've done. Maybe seeing for the very first time. For some. Come Holy Spirit. As we worship, would you release us to trust not on ourselves, but to trust in you. Reveal yourself, I pray. Come Lord Jesus.